Amen. Won't you please have a seat? Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome to Potomac Hills. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Andy Pagani, and I'm one of your deacons. I'm glad you're here, and I also extend a good morning uh, welcome to those that are joining us online. If this is your first time here or your first time in a long time, we welcome you to and direct you to our website via our bulletin uh, QR code uh, so that you can complete our Connect card and record your visit. All right. Uh, first, we have two announcements to share this morning. Um, first, be sure to mark your calendars. There will be a good Friday service on Friday, March 29th at 6.30 p.m. here at Harper Park. And then second, the Spring Kid Stuff Giveaway will be held Saturday, April 20th at Douglas Community Center. Volunteer help is needed with picking up and sorting clothes over the next few weeks. Please contact Lana Zollenhofer if you are able to help. All right, now it's time for us to turn our attention through the Lord in our responsive call to worship. This morning's reading is from the book of Isaiah. I'll speak as the leader and you as the people. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that his Lord has granted us and the great goodness of the house of Israel, that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He said, surely they are my people children who will not deal falsely, and he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we gather in your presence today with open hearts and minds, ready to worship and praise your holy name. We ask that you bless this time of worship so that we may be uplifted and inspired by your presence. Fill us with your love and grace and help us to honor you in all that we do. May our worship be pleasing to you and may we be transformed by the power of your spirit. We offer this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and continue to join us for worship? Yeah. 
Okay, so now is our time for worship through prayer, where we uh, pray expectantly, showing God to be great and demonstrating our faith in a God who is near enough to know and care about our every need, yet powerful enough to help us. So let us pray. The congregation will pray in unison the parts in bold print. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Sovereign Lord, in accordance with Psalm 89, we thank you for your steadfast love and your faithfulness to all generations. Thank you for your covenant you made with David, the covenant that is fulfilled in your son. Father, help us to be your people of gather and worship, to sing your praises. Help us to be people who love to speak to our family and friends in order to make known your faithfulness. However, Lord, we are so very weak, though we may seem strong to others, how shall we stand in an age of spiritual weakness? Wait upon the Lord, who is our salvation and glory. He is our rock and our refuge. Be our strength, Lord of all strength. Hear our prayer. Sovereign God, we pray on behalf of your church throughout the world for this congregation and for those who serve us within the Presbyterian Church in America. Today, we pray specifically for the PCA agencies and their presidents. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and bless the ministry of college in Lookout Mount Tennessee and the new president, Dr. Brad Voyles. Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and its president, Dr. Tom Gibbs, PCA Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia, and its president, ruling elder, Mr. Tom Townsend, Geneva Benefits Group in Atlanta, Georgia, and its president, Reverend Egg Dunnington, Reverend Tamham and Palace Center in Brevard, North Carolina, Kono, Ohio and it's uh, for Mr. Wallace Anderson, Jr. Oh, God, all of these spoken requests and all of our unspoken requests we present to you in the faithful name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Bow your heads with me now as I continue to pray using Psalm 97. Lord, as we just prayed, we ask that you be our strength. We thank you that we can trust in you because of your steadfastness to your covenant people. You don't change from one day to the next. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In the midst of our sin and our struggles, we praise you for being faithful and for loving us. We praise you for the battles that you have fought on our behalf and for the protection that you provide for our souls. We give thanks for your grace and mercy that you've shown us. We did nothing to deserve being loved by you, and yet you love us in ways that we simply cannot imagine. We praise you, Lord, for your reign over all the earth, and that your power and your rule is good news for all the nations. We are mindful that we have no right to come before you. You are holy and just in who you are and in everything you do. Were we to come into your presence on our own, we would be utterly consumed and so our need for cleansing and holiness is ever apparent. As lightning for a moment lights the world, it is only by the light of the gospel that we can see ourselves and our world truly. We marvel that even when we see as huge and permanent is temporary and weak before you, for you made it all. We praise you that all your works are good and just and find their fulfillment in Jesus, in whom we can be counted righteous. Guard us, we pray, from the foolishness of trusting in things that will disappoint us, money, career, status, even family, or our devotion to ministry. When we are reminded of how you acted in the past, we rejoice and are glad. 
knowing that you are unchanging and still work only for our good. There is no one like you and none more deserving of honor and praise, and yet you draw us into a relationship with yourself in Jesus. We praise you for enabling us to turn from sin and temptation by the power of your spirit, whom you have placed within us. What we are powerless to do on our own, you do in us. There is no joy like that of being forgiven, cleansed, and welcomed by our glorious and powerful Father God. May we sing and speak and meditate on your praises, for we are those to whom you have made yourself known. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, at this time, we will now turn towards corporate and private confession of sin and assurance and pardon. Please recite the following corporate confession along with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, deeper than all our sin. Forgive our frivolous attitude toward life, our callousness toward suffering, our envy to those who are other than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure, our indifference to the treasures of heaven, our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me now in taking a few moments uh, for private confession to the Lord. If you're not sure how or what to pray during this time, we suggest using the prayer public confession we just prayed as a guide for your prayer. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows his compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Please rise now as we continue to worship. Our Lord gives us many, many gifts, some of which we get to keep longer than others and some which we have to give away sooner but uh something i'm sure of is that the gifts that we receive from our gracious god are meant to bless others and are not meant to stay with us so i'd encourage you to consider giving to the ministry of potomac hills presbyterian church but let's sing of god's blessed assurance Echoes 
Have a seat. Go stand over there. Go stand over there. <laughs> I'd like to invite all the children that are headed to Children's Church to come on down. I guess I'll just stay over here, away from the speaker. <laughs> okay, let's fold our hands, bow our heads, close our eyes. Father God, we thank you that we get to be in your house today, that we get to come and worship you. For Lord, you are great and you are worthy. Lord, we love you so much. And Lord, we ask that you would help us learn more about you in Children's Church. Be with our teachers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Potomac Hills Presbyterian Church. My name is Frank Wong. I'm the associate pastor here. We're, we're, we are walking through the life of the Lord Jesus uh, this year, and so if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. We're on week three of a four-week series sub-series on the Sermon on the Mount. And two weeks ago, I preached on the Beatitudes. And we saw that uh, to be blessed is to be brought into the very presence of God, to seek him face to face. We're going to try this one so that you won't blast out your ears. Okay. Yeah, there, there we go. It's a little bit better. So, um, Two weeks ago, we saw the Beatitudes uh, and what it means to be blessed, to be brought into the very presence of God, to see him face to face. And then, uh, and we get that in the gospel through our union with Christ. And then last week, Dave taught us on some of the practical considerations of what it means to give up our rights for the sake of our persecutors, to extend grace to those who hurt us, and to love our enemies. And we do all of that because Jesus did that for us. And this morning, as we come to the Lord's Prayer, the focus is shifting more inward, more uh, toward examining our hearts, our motives, and who truly rules our lives. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. 
And when you pray, do not heap up the empty phrases as Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you will forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray. Father, we come to you uh, this morning because we need you. You are worthy of all praise and all glory. And so, Lord, we do ask, as we are taught to pray, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. And Lord, we ask that you would give us eyes to see that kingdom, to see your will, to love your kingdom, and to love your will. And yet we come as needy people, people with many thoughts, uh, worries, and cares, and anxieties. And Lord, we ask that you would help us quiet them, that we might hear from you, that we might see the wonder of your grace and the goodness of your gospel that we might see your son through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, if I asked you to think of a time when someone went full diva, who would you think about? What would you think about? For me, um, most of my thoughts tend towards uh, pro, pro athletes, um, throwing massive tantrums. I think it's hilarious sometimes. Um, Antonio Brown throwing off his jersey and pads in the middle of a game while his team is playing and then trotting off the field to the locker room in mid-game, right? That was crazy. Uh, if you think back to the mid-2000s, uh, there was Terrell Owens doing an impromptu press conference in his driveway where he would do sit-ups in his driveway for the press. Um, if you remember that, that was kind of crazy too. Uh, he want, did that to express his displeasure towards the Philadelphia Eagles. You could, on the pop culture side of things, you could point to the downward spiral of uh, teenage pop stars like Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera and Miley Cyrus and Lindsay Lohan. You know, they all share something in common. And it's really just a hunger and thirst for attention. That diva attitude is one of, look at me, look at me. Thank God I am not one of those divas. Thank God I do not do attention-seeking things or have an attitude of, look at me. And you know by my grin that that's just not true, right? Of course, I absolutely do those attention-seeking things too. After all, I'm in a profession that asks people to look at me and listen to me and pay attention to me every single week, as I'm asking you to do right now. <laughs> and while I don't have the platform or the star power that my examples have, and while I'm maybe not as over the top dramatic as they are, Sarah might have something to say about that, um, I absolutely do engage in attention-seeking behavior because I really do want things to be about me. In college, it was the game of one-upsmanship. I've said this from the pulpit a, a couple of times. You know, it's sort of like, well, what, what's on your load this week? Oh, I've got 300 pages of reading, two papers. I raise you, your three, I see your 300 pa pages and two papers, and I raise you 1,000 pages, four exams, and three papers. It's still look at me, just in a different style. Or when I had really little, little kids at home, it was... How poorly did they sleep? Um, behold, how strong and perseverant I am, functioning on little to no sleep. Praise me for my endurance and steadfastness in the face of suffering. Profound, tremendous suffering. Right? Now, sharing our struggles and our lives is important. I'm not saying that we ought not to share our struggles or our lives, but I wonder if we were to pause and examine ourselves that it goes a little bit beyond just wanting to share what we're going through. That we would find a similar self-centeredness and self-absorption as those examples early on. Does everything really just lead back to ourselves? 
And the answer is probably yes, at least in part. And unfortunately, we're probably more self-centered and self-focused than we are willing to admit. But really, we see this come out in one place consistently. It comes out more than any place else that I can think of in my life. It comes out in my prayer life. I'm always sort of praying about myself. And so let's look, starting at verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. You see, the ancient Near East wasn't any different from today. They too had people who were show-offs and had people with a pervasive look at me or everything is about me attitude. Now, we might not be like this, right? We might not be the people who pray out on the street corner, but what are they doing? They're doing a performance. These hypocrites want to look godly without actually being godly. Their prayer isn't about God at all, but rather themselves. It's their, about their egos and their reputations. Unless you think that because we're not the kind of people to heap up empty phrases in our prayers or to pray out on street corners so that everyone can see that we're not these people, we too also put on performances in prayer or just put on performances in general. Think about posting online. You have no chance of convincing anybody about anything online, and yet we post. Why? I would figure it's more about us than it is about anybody else or what we're even trying to communicate. Let's take that responsive prayer that we just prayed not a few minutes ago that Andy so graciously led us in. I'd be willing to bet that some of us, and maybe not all of us, but at least some of us, just read the words like robots. I've done it. I'm supposed to read this part, and so I do. But are we genuinely praying the words that we're reading? Or is this really for the person next to me? So that I don't look out of place or that I can maintain the facade that I'm actively engaged in worship. It's still self-centered, just subtler. What about prayer over meals? While I'm all for praying over your meals and thanking God for the food that he has given us, I'll bet that many of us just pray over meals because that's what you do as a Christian. But is there really a, a true thankfulness being expressed or is it just rote? And ironically, the Lord's prayer itself has become often performative in its familiarity. How many of us have recited the Lord's Prayer out of rote habit? It doesn't really mean, oh, we say all these great words. It doesn't really mean anything to us. Are we genuinely being affected by what we're being taught in the Lord's Prayer? And even when we are praying genuinely, it's often self-centered and self-focused. We tend to start with asking the Lord for things, continue by asking the Lord for things, and finish by asking the Lord for things. In Jesus' name, of course. And we tend to pray for comfort, for help, for provision, for wisdom, for discernment, for that test that's coming up, or for this, that, or the other. And usually it's just all about me. Instead of asking others to look at me, I'm just, just asking God to do so. It's all about my needs, my wants, my hopes, my dreams, my anxieties, my hurts, or something else. And if prayer is really a conversation with the Lord, if that's what prayer really is, a conversation with the Lord, then we're like those people that we can't stand, that only talk about themselves. Jesus doesn't want us to be like that. Jesus doesn't want us to be that kind of person. He doesn't want us to be like these hypocrites in verses 5 to 8. And so he teaches us how to pray. Interestingly, the Lord's Prayer isn't actually a prayer that Jesus would have lifted up. There's that bit about 
debts in verse 12, referring to legal obligations that point to sin. And so Jesus isn't asking for forgiveness because he didn't sin. But rather, Jesus is instructing us how to pray. In truth, the Lord's Prayer is instructive rather than formulaic. We often say, this is how you should pray. Pray like this, as if it was like a mantra. We're not to just repeat it like a mantra, but rather we are to see what Jesus is telling us through the Lord's Prayer, that we might be moved out of our patterns of self-centeredness and self-focus and into a gospel-centered, Christ-focused one. And so let's examine the Lord's Prayer to see what we can glean. Verses 9 to 13, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Probably the first thing that we ought to see is the order of the prayer's first, uh, prayer's six petitions. The first three focus on God's glory. It isn't till the second set of three petitions that our good comes into focus. And that's helpful for us because while God's glory and our good cannot be separated, the order does in fact matter. Where we go wrong isn't in the asking for help or in asking for things that we care about, no matter how big or how small. Where we go wrong is that we ask first and sometimes only for our good with almost no care for God's glory. And the fact that our good comes in the context, and remember context is king, of course, that our good comes in the context of glorifying God. The imbalance in our prayer lives reveals a heart condition that is concerning. Do we truly hallow his name? Do we want his kingdom to come or do we want our wills and our kingdoms to come? We again probably know the answer to these questions, but the Lord's Prayer is reorienting for us. It's calling us to remember back to the Beatitudes, that blessedness is to be found in the very presence of God's glory. After all, the chief end of man is God-focused. It is to glorify God and to enjoy him, not ourselves. And if we were to try to summarize these first three petitions, we'd say the obvious. God comes first when we pray. Well, duh. He is to be preeminent in our lives, as Paul puts it in Colossians chapter 1. He is to have a special place in our lives at the very top of our priorities. Our desire is to not be chiefly for ourselves, but for his kingdom. Hence the call to reorient ourselves to him and his kingdom. And that desire for God, for God to be glorified and for his kingdom to come and to reign over all, also means that we have things to do, that we want to see God's will to be done here in us and around us as it is in heaven. That's another way of saying that things ought to be like when Jesus returns, when we will dwell in a new heaven and a new earth. And this really truly sort of echoes our, the cry of our hearts for the Lord to come quickly, that the Lord would come to redeem all things and to change the brokenness and hurt of this world. Not just because we feel acutely the brokenness and the neediness and the insecurity of this world, but also simply because we yearn for things to be made right. We should want the redemption of all things, and we should focus on that and focus on what the Lord is doing in this world. But let's remember that we are asking these things, that we are asking for these things, but we're asking for them with a focus on the Lord that we want his will to be done, that we're asking for those things that are godly to become true in our lives too. We're asking to see him more clearly for his his glory to be magnified in our hearts. It's focused on him while still asking for me. And that's a good transition to the next set of petitions, us second, God first, us second. It's important to say here that our needs are important to the Lord, of course, we are to, he calls us to cry out to him. We're to ask him for things. We're to bring everything that we care about to him. After all, the Lord's Prayer is comprised entirely of petitions, which means that literally the whole Lord's Prayer is asking the Lord for things. 
But of course, it's asking the Lord specifically for us to focus on him first and then us second. And so God does care about our experience, our provision, our care, our daily bread is in fact important to him. Everything that we wrestle and struggle with, he wants us to bring it all to him. The Lord's prayer isn't asking us to disregard ourselves. The, Lord, the Lord's prayer is not saying God first and only. He is, the Lord's prayer is saying and fully recognizing that as we wait for the Lord's kingdom to come in all of its fullness, that as we wait, that we have true and real needs. We have debts to be forgiven. We've done stuff that's not good but we've also had stuff done to us that we need to forgive as well. And extending forgiveness is harder than receiving forgiveness sometimes because we have to pay the cost of somebody else's sin against us. And so we have a need. The Lord's Prayer doesn't gloss over our lives, telling you to only look at Jesus. That's not the story of the Bible nor of the gospel, to just look at Jesus as if nothing else matters. You do matter. Your life does matter. And the Lord cares about you. And while everything is first God and we are to properly have a context, yet the Lord still recognizes that we are a needy people this side of his return. And of course, we are again reminded of our sinfulness at the end of the Lord's Prayer. We are weak to temptation, and so it's better to ask to avoid it entirely. And yet we know that we often seek temptation out, walking in evil. And so as we confess our needs, deliverance is right there at the top. But do you see how the shift has, the, the focus has shifted? When we start with our good, when we start with what we want, what we need, it's all about us. But when we focus on him first, our asks, become, our asks come in the context of dependence on him. Even in our cute needs, our feelings, our provision, our fill-in-the-blank, whatever, we look to the Lord for fulfillment. It's, a, it's, it's really subtle. It's a subtle shift. The focus moving from the fulfillment of our need to the fulfiller of the need. And to summarize, the Lord's Prayer asks us to reorient toward God. To understand the context of our lives is to be found in him and not in ourselves. But that reorientation is difficult for us. We understand what the Lord's Prayer is calling us to do, but how to do it is another issue entirely, which brings us to verse 14 and 15, which are some of the hardest verses in the Bible. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. On the face of it, these verses are difficult to hear. Not because we don't understand them. We understand the this for that nature of these verses very well. They are difficult because they speak to an unattainably high bar for us. And because there doesn't really seem to be a provision, should we fail? In short, this feels a lot like works righteousness and not the grace that we're so accustomed to hearing. And here the context helps. These words aren't spoken to people outside of the faith, but rather assumes that we do actually want the six petitions in the Lord's Prayer. And we can only want God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven if we are, to be, if we are found in Jesus. That's the only way that we can truly say, Lord, I want your kingdom to come is if we are found in Jesus first. And so really from that perspective, these verses aren't calling us to ask to a forgiveness that leads to salvation, but rather they're reorienting us to what we already know to be true, that we have been forgiven our trespasses, and also that true faith always bears true fruit. Friends, this again is God first and us second. We're called to forgive not because that's what's expected of us, because, but because that's who we truly are. We don't forgive because we have to. We forgive because that's just who we are. We are Christians. 
We are being conformed to his image. We are being made more and more into his likeness as we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. We have been crucified with Christ, and so we no longer live, but it is Christ who lives within us. And so if Christ is living within you, you must forgive as Christ forgives because that's who Christ is and that's who you are. The fruit of a faith that comes from being united to Christ bears fruit in line with being in Christ. And so we look at these verses and the call to be like Christ as just reorienting from the old life to the new one to the true one, in fact, to live in line with who you really are, to be true to yourself, not just not the old sinful self that is focused on you, but rather the new self that looks to the Lord Jesus. And so what does this look like? What does it look like to use the Lord's prayer to reorient us away from ourselves and toward the Lord? What impact does the Lord's prayer have on my life? And I think to close, I want to share a, bit, a little bit of, about how meditating on the Lord's Prayer this week has changed my life. And yes, I understand the irony of asking you to look at me in my life and all of that, but I'd ask you to imitate me as I try to imitate Christ. The past two and a half weeks have been terrible, have been really difficult for me. A couple of weeks ago, I told you about my best friend, and his twins, who are born prematurely at 30 weeks. Uh, by all accounts, they're doing fantastic. I heard from him this morning. Uh, Matthew is off of CPAP and breathing on his own. Christina's a little bit behind him, but they're both doing great. I told you about all the feelings that had stretched up in me from when Nathaniel was in the NICU, about feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, of powerlessness, and just anxiety. That's been a lot on my heart. And then I received word on last Saturday, not yesterday, but the week before, that a former student of mine at McLean had died suddenly of a, of a blood clot. She was 28, or something like that, late 20s. She was full of life, just a wonderful presence for the Lord. Everyone spoke so so highly of her joy that just seemed to radiate out of her. She had just given birth to her son 12 days ago, prior to her death. She so clearly loved the Lord. To say it was a shock was an understatement. I hadn't seen her for something like 11 years until I saw her randomly at Timo's church on my sabbatical. A couple of weeks, a few weeks ago when I was on study leave, I went and visited and I said to myself, I'm going to see Monica. It was the day after she had given birth. I forgot to see her again. That's a lot on my heart. Surprising how much it was on my heart when I went to her funeral on Friday. That same Saturday, I learned from, that a friend of mine from a couple of churches ago had a massive heart attack and was in a medically induced coma with brain damage that we don't know the extent of. He's home now with his wife, awake, lucid. What a joy that is, but still, that was a lot. And then, of course, last Monday. We lost our beloved Iris Dillard. You know, as I stand here preaching, there, are, as I look around and I can see all of you looking at me, and I would always be able to look at Iris, and I would always be able to tell how I was doing, and almost always she's smiling at me. Sometimes she's frowning at me, but, you know, for the most part, she's smiling at me and, and you know, giving me my amen. I will never hear that again from her. And that's a lot too. Even now it's just sinking in. So when life hits me hard, how do I pray? The temptation is to ask for so much, for protection and healing for the twins and their mother, for strength for my best friend, for comfort for Monica's husband and baby boy, for healing for Steve, for 
peace for my friends, for comfort for Mark and Phoebe and Kay and Eli and Emily and Aaron and all of their families. And even if it's for others, even as I pray for others, I'm really still asking for relief for me and for my feelings. Me. And yet the Lord's Prayer calls us to something better. It calls us not to look at our losses, profound as they may be, or at our anxieties, as understandable and right as they may be, or at our feelings, as overwhelming as they may be. Rather, it calls us to reorient ourselves to the Lord, to stand in the midst of the storm, as Job did, and to say, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To fix our eyes on Christ, as Peter did, as he walked on the, on the water amidst the wind and the waves, and as he began to sink at the same time, he fixes his eyes upon the Lord and cries out, looking at him first and himself second. In him we are brought into the very presence of his glory through our union with God Almighty that we might see him face to face. And when we do see him through the love and support of our brothers and sisters in Christ who stand in for him as his hands and feet in our lives. It becomes Jesus help me rather than help me Jesus. And so when I spoke to my friend JT, he told me something his pastor told him and I'm gonna just rip him off. His pastor told him, my hope is that you would see Jesus to be everything that he has already shown himself to be in your life. Jesus doesn't downplay our needs, but meets us in them. The Lord's Prayer calls us to remember where our comfort is found, that in life and in death, we are not our own, but belong body and soul to our faithful savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we need in times like this. When, you're, when we are stretched far beyond ourselves, when life seems to overwhelm, we need to be reminded that we bear the name of the one who is faithful to the end. The Lord's prayer reorients us to that great truth, that God's glory and our good are inseparable, and that our greatest good is found in his glory. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, we do pray that your glory would be great in our lives, that we wouldn't be able to tear our eyes from how great your glory is, how great your goodness is, that your kingdom would come in our lives, that we would be solidly for you and you only that your will would be done in earth as it is in heaven. And the cry of our hearts is that that would be true, that you would come quickly, that we might be delivered. And yet, Lord, we have great needs in this time. We need our daily bread. We need our deliverance. We need our forgiveness that can only be found in you. And so, Lord, lead us not into the temptation of being self-oriented, of being self-focused, of being about me, but deliver us from that evil that we might be about you, that we might find our greatest good in you. Lord, help us fix our eyes upon you amidst the wind and the waves, amidst our own sinking, amidst everything, that you might be glorified and that we might enjoy you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our Lord bids us come to him as broken people. Let's rise up and do just that.
benediction from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. We'll see you next week.